Please turn with me in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. Uh, would you please stand for the reading of God's Word? We stand to show reverence to the Word of God that has been revealed to us and to the God of the Word who has been so gracious to show us His will. Philippians chapter 2, um, I'm going to read a little bit ahead and we'll start with verse 1 and we'll go a little bit beyond what's listed here. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Here ends God's word for today. Please be seated. The title for today's message is, Jesus, our humble Savior and Exemplar. Jesus, our humble Savior and Exemplar. You know, yesterday I was doing my final walk through the sermon notes just to make sure I made some final tweaks that I needed to, and there came upon me a conviction that I haven't felt in a long time. I had prepared this message for a long period of time. I thought I had internalized it. I thought I was good with it. But the Lord, by the Spirit, took that word and then applied it to a place which I had been totally blind to. One of the things with God's word is it's living and active. You know, I might have memorized the text so many times and I've applied it in other parts and thought, okay, I'm kind of good here. But the beauty of God's work in our lives is the Spirit of God takes the word and then opens our eyes to those areas where we need to see God's will happen. And um, this is one of those rich texts that we are going to see this morning, and I pray that you'd be encouraged and comforted as well as we hear from God's Word. So let me begin by praying to our God for help. Our loving Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we were talking about joy earlier this morning, and uh, Philippians is that book of joy. It's a book that just bursts forth with joy, and especially joy in those circumstances where you think it's impossible to find joy. Uh, the whole book is, uh, resonates from beginning to end. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. And there is a hope that we have in Christ that Paul takes from his own revelation that he has received from Jesus Christ, the way God has proved himself in his own life. And in fact, the book, as it is being written, is written in the prisons of, prison 
from a prison in Rome while Paul exudes that joy to the Philippians to whom he is writing. And his exhortation is that they would be filled with joy. Now, let me give you a quick introduction in a couple of minutes, and then we'll dive into our text in Philippians 2. Uh, as many of you may know, uh, Philippians, the church at Philippi was founded by the Apostle Paul when he was in the second missionary journey in the book, if you check in Acts chapter 16, you get to see how God brought or directed Paul's steps to this town in Macedonia, uh, the first European town, if you will, where the gospel comes through Paul. Uh, he first meets Lydia, the first convert, and then he has this ministry in Philippi, and before he leaves, he gets to minister to the Philippian jailer where he and his household come to faith in the Lord. And then after that point in time where Paul was kicked out in some ways by the authorities, the church in Philippi stayed in touch with Paul. They had received the gospel. They had come to know Jesus Christ, and they were grateful for all that they had received, and they wanted to support Paul through the ministry that Paul had. So throughout the years, they have been supporting him. 2 Corinthians 8 talks about how the Philippians in their poverty were glad to support the work of the ministry of Paul as the gospel was proclaimed. Now, when you look at the book of Philippians, in Philippians 1.6, Paul says, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. You know, that should be a cause for great joy for all of us. I didn't begin my salvation. Jesus did. I don't have to finish this work of salvation in my life because I can't, but Jesus will. He who began that good work in me will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. What a comfort that is to know that God who saved me and rescued me from the, from the depths of my own depravity and sin, from the consequences of hell and damnation, even as I struggle through my walk here, is with me and will bring me to the finish and present me as spotless with the bride of Christ. There must be great joy there. Now, from the beginning to the end, God doesn't just kind of leave us to figure out what happens in the middle. In fact, Paul, in, first, uh, in Philippians 1.21, he says, For me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. I need to pause here for a moment. Last week when we were here, we were just overwhelmed by the love and affection that you as a body showed us. And I can't thank you enough for all that you continue to do. Thank you, brother. I sweat a lot. Um, <laughs> that's an understatement. Um, but in verse 21, Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And he bookends his life by saying, you know, the purpose of my life, everything I do is Christ himself because he has taken over me and my life ought to be lived for him. And then what is the worst thing that could happen? If I were to die, I get to be with Christ. I get more of Christ. So there is just greater joy to be had should the worst, from a human term, happen to me. So there is really nothing that can prevent me from enjoying this life that God has given me here to live on earth. Now from verse 21 of chapter 1, Paul has a train of thought that he is speaking through. So we don't have time to walk through all of those, but I just want to kind of show you a few spotlights so that when you come to this text, you know what Paul is thinking in our particular text. In the verses that follow here, if you can check in the end of Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 to 30, Paul there is saying, you know, for me to live as Christ, what does that look like? A, a huge part of that is unity in the body of Christ. If Christ is the head, to live for me is to follow Christ. That means that I am unified with the body of Christ, his church, his people, in the way in which I live out my life here on earth. And part of that would involve standing firm, stecho. It involves uh, taking a stance against the world that is so easily encroaching and surrounding and trying to crush the work of God in our midst. So that's 27 to 30. And then in um, verses 1 through 4, which I just read, there is a unity in the body, in the church, that comes through humility. I'll speak a little bit more about that. And then in verses 5 through 11, we get to see the greatest example of humility, which is Christ himself. What has Christ accomplished on our behalf? And um, 
and I, just a quick note here, some people look at Jesus as the great example, great teacher, great person, you follow him and you're all set. That, taken in its entirety, is a lie and it damns your soul. No one can follow Christ perfectly. Christ is the perfect one. He came here fundamentally in order to rescue me from the, perfect, from the sins that I commit because I can never do the perfect life that Christ alone can. So when I look to Christ, the first and foremost thought should be Savior. He has accomplished that which I cannot ever do. And so that's the foremost way in which we need to look to Christ. But that said, for believers, those who have a new heart, those who have the Spirit of God indwelling them, those who have the love of God looking to Jesus and wanting to follow Him with all of our lives, we do have a great example in Jesus Christ. The Bible does say, uh, Paul does say, you know, imitate me as I imitate Christ. We are required to follow after Christ, to walk in His steps, as the Apostle John would say. But that follows only after we look to Jesus as our Savior. So again, in 5 through 11, we're going to see unity, uh, humility in Jesus Christ himself. And then finally, I just read verses 12 and 13, but you can continue all the way to 18. You get to see how your walk as a believer promotes that unity, how you live out your life uh, in Christ that brings the saints together and testifies to the work of Christ uh, in our in the world. So with that, let's now jump into the introduction, which is verses 1 through 4. Unity in the church. Now, in verse 1, you get to see, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation of love, any fellowship in the Spirit, any affection and compassion, make my joy complete. Now, let me ask you this question. As you come to worship here as a body, do you have all of these? Encouragement, consolation, fellowship, affection, and compassion. Sometimes I forget that this is a great privilege for me to be with the body of Christ and experience all these. When I was an unbeliever, I remember how dark and cold and isolated life can be in the world when you're cut off from God alienated from the people of God and their joy. This is what we have come to enjoy because Jesus saved each of us and put us together and poured out his love in our midst. Now, Paul says, having experienced this in this body, he says, make my joy complete in verse 2 by being of the same mind. I want you to look in verse 2 all the verbs that Paul uses. You have experienced this, and therefore you want to do certain things. The first and foremost being, be of the same mind. You want to have the same mind with each other about those things of God in your midst. He says, maintain the same love. He says, be united in spirit. He says, be intent on one purpose. So here are some of the verbs, these actions that bring about that unity. He says, he's a call to each of us to say, here are some things I ought to do. Now you might say, well, these things come very naturally. Does it? Well, if you hang around with me long enough, you'll say, it is hard to be of the same mind with Pradeep. I'm a sinner saved by grace, and so are you, and so is everybody else here. We all can prick each other in ways that are uncomfortable. And it's easy to say, you know, let me just kind of step back a little bit and let them be what they are. But that's not what Paul is saying. He says, be of the same mind. There is a responsibility that each of us has a, as a believer to be unified and to live out this work that God is doing in our midst. And then if you look in verse 3, he says, there are, there are two things to watch in verse 3 and 4. There are some things you want to avoid and some things you want to do. What are the things you want to avoid? He says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. He says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. It's so easy for me to do a lot of things from selfishness. Very often, my first mode of thought is, what does Pradeep want to do, as opposed to what he's going to say in verse 4. Uh, he says, do not merely look out for your own personal interests. Um, it is okay to care for our needs, but that ought not to be the only source of our vision as we live our lives. So what should you do? He says, 
with humility, consider one another as more important than yourself. In fact, that uh, with humility, that's going to be our anchor because that's from which Paul is going to launch into verses 5 through 11. He has given some mandate in verses 1 through 4, and in verses 5 through 11, he's going to kind of expound on it with Jesus Christ. Consider one another more important than yourselves. And do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. You see, Philippi was one of the churches that had everything going for them. This was one of the highly commended churches in the New Testament, and even they had problems. There is no church on this side of eternity. When we get to heaven as a church, we will be glorified. We won't be sinning. We won't be having these challenges that we have with each other. But in Philippians 4, we get to see Euodia and Syntyche, that dear sisters in the Lord that just couldn't quite work together. And Paul's like, he's kind of calling them out, dear sisters, we work together. But would others in the body come alongside, help them have that same mind? And that's kind of what Paul is instructing them to do here. Now, before we jump into humility, I want to give an overview on where humility fits in your spiritual walk. All of you know about salvation. Salvation is how God saves us and rescues us from the penalty of sin and the power of sin in our lives. There are two components to it. There's justification and sanctification. Most of us know clearly what happens in justification. Uh, in justification, uh, I'm going to use a little illustration so you can remember this when you go leave the church. There is a coin that's springs the soul from an eternity in hell. You know, Tetzel used it in the wrong way, which was he used a physical money coin. He said it will get you out of purgatory. But there is a coin that springs your soul from eternity in hell. It has two sides to it. One side is repentance and the other side is faith. Repent and believe is the call to salvation. Um, and when we, we understand what belief is, belief is to trust in God, to say the work of Jesus Christ is sufficient for my sin, and I believe that he has died for my sins and paid it all on the cross. When we talk about repentance, and this is a part that sometimes I forget because I've been saved so long back, when I think of repentance, here is the key to it. What, am I actually, what did I actually say when I was justified? I said that the life that I have lived up until now with all of my powers and strengths and ability is rubbish. Every good that I thought I had accomplished that I should be proud of, I say, is deserving of condemnation. That, I contend, my friends, is the chief act of humility that it takes for anyone to come before God. Because the proud man can never find salvation because he is satisfied with himself. I had to come to the point of abject humility to say everything I've done is rubbish and I need Jesus Christ. So that's how we begin our life of faith with humility. Now let's come to sanctification. So justification begins with repentance and faith and humility is essential. Now when we look at sanctification... I contend that it is no different. Justification is a one-time deed. When you believe in Jesus Christ, you become a child of God and you remain forever. You don't have to keep becoming a child of God every time you sin. But in sanctification, God continues to do that work in you and, and the life and the position that you have as a child of God works itself out in practice. But this aspect of repentance, we prayed about confession uh, of our sins. Why do we do that? Because we recognize that what began here continues as we recognize that sin is horrible before God. I recognize my sin continually until one day I will sin no more. And I continue to walk by faith. You know, in Galatians, Paul says, you don't just begin your life by faith and then do things by work. You need God to help you walk by faith. So repentance and faith continue to enfold the life of a believer in your sanctification. And this repentance, and every time I confess my sin, I acknowledge that I have failed in some way, shape, or form to obey God or to 
to either do those things he has called me to or not do those things that he has, prevent, uh, that he has forbidden me from doing. And that attitude ought to carry over into my relationship with my brothers and sisters in Christ. And so that humility that began my walk of salvation ought to characterize the life of a believer as I continue to walk by faith in Jesus Christ. So with that, we're coming into our main text. Uh, I hope some of you are familiar with the ski jump. I've never done it, but I've seen it on TV. I've done some skiing terribly, fallen down many times. But the ski jump is so cool because, as you know, the skier comes down at a very high speed, down a very steep incline without tumbling down, and then they take off, and then they go up in the air and try to go as far as they can before they land. So there are three parts to the ski jump. One is coming down, the other one is going up in the air as far as you can, and then landing it or sticking it so you don't fall down um, when, you, when you land. Now, if you think of our text in Philippians 2, verses 1 to 4 is like you're coming down. There is some things that Paul has told the believers about unity and humility. He says, uh, in humility, count others as more significant than yourself. That's verses 1 through 4. He's given a command, an imperative. These are things we must do. So you're gaining speed as you come down. And then just as you're about to go in verse 5, he tells you something. Have this attitude, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Now, the command is very hard because those things that you need to do to one another, humanly speaking, is impossible. And then in verses 5 through 11, as you are just taking off, he takes you pretty much into the throne room of heaven and gives you a glimpse of Jesus Christ. Here is someone who has done this perfectly, and he is your savior and your exemplar. So you want to keep your eyes fixed on Jesus as we are kind of floating through. There's no command here, but they are all tied back to what you see in verses 1 through 4 and verse 5. So my responsibility in the next several minutes will be to show you who Jesus is in this particular area, and therefore, what must you do in light of the gospel. So let's begin with verse 5. And I want to ask you this question. When you think of humility, what is it? How does it look like in your life. So if you look at verse 5, we read, have this attitude in yourselves, which, is, which was also in Christ Jesus. There is a mindset, an attitude that needs to govern the life of a believer, and that attitude comes from the same attitude that Jesus Christ has. Um, Let me give you a couple of bullet points before I dive in. In verse 6, you're going to see that humility doesn't seek its own rights. In verse 7, humility even accepts humiliation for God. And in verses 7 and 8, you're going to see the incarnation and crucifixion as great examples of that. Uh, but before we dive into verse 5, there is a song that I want to use because I think it it's, it wasn't written with Philippians 2 in mind, but it parallels the text of Philippians 2 very well. This is a song that many of you may be familiar with. It says, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. And then the refrain goes, you came from heaven to earth to show the way, from the earth to the cross, my debt to pay, from the cross to the grave, and from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. And th those are the texts that we're going to see from Philippians 5, uh, 2, verses 5 through 11. So let me go back to verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves, which, is, which was also in Christ Jesus. You must have Christ's attitude. Simple. It's a very simple verse in the Bible. There's no two ways to see it. Why must you have this attitude as Jesus Christ did? If you look back at the earlier part of Philippians 1, it's for unity in the church. If you want to have unity in the church, you need to have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had. Why else do you want to have this attitude of Jesus Christ? Because you, my dear brothers and sisters, are in Christ. If you've been saved with Christ, you have Christ in you, which is the hope of glory. So you cannot but be transformed by the mind of Christ as you think those thoughts of Christ 
after him. Why else would you want to have this attitude of Christ? Because it is your duty and your virtue. I've been saved from much, and it's with much gratitude that I want to follow after Christ and do those things that God has called me to. And in doing so, I am reflecting the beauty of Christ to a world that does not know him. They can't see Jesus on the streets. Most people say, well, did Jesus ever live? But the, when or Jesus said, when people see the love that you have for one another, they will glorify my God who is in heaven. You get to showcase the power of God in the transformation of your lives as people see and come to know Jesus through your words. All right, so with that, let's look at the next verse in verse 6. Humility does not seek its own rights. Um, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped. Remember, we are looking at this text with verse 5, have this attitude that Christ has. Now let's ask ourselves the question, what does verse 6 mean? Verse 6 is such a beautiful verse. It's like a diamond with so many facets. You can just stare on it for years and years and years and still not quite unpack everything that it has. But it is also a verse that can be easily misunderstood. So I want you to be careful in making sure you know what this text says. So let me ask you the question from verse 6. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? If you see in the verse here, it says, he already existed in the form of God. Jesus is God. Okay, you might say, okay, that's a no-brainer. You don't have to stress that out so much, but you want to be very careful because people have misunderstood what this verse means. The word here for form is morphe. It is talking about the substance. In fact, many of you may be familiar with the uh, definition of the Trinity where we have three persons with one substance or essence. There is only one God in three persons. And here it is talking about the second person of the Trinity who is of the same essence or of the same substance as God. So there is no, uh, uh, dis no um, you know, when you talk about the Trinity, you have to be very careful. Any word you see will and should be used against you because you can become a heretic very easily. Uh, here you are you're talking about Jesus as being fully God. Now, let me ask you this question. What were Jesus' rights? What did the second person of the Trinity have as his right? It is equality with God. He has all the privileges of the deity because he is God. There is, again, a simple no-brainer question. But now I'm asking you the question which you want to apply for yourself. What was the attitude of the second person of the Trinity toward his rights. If you look at this verse again closely, he says, he did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped. What does that mean? He is equal with God. The verse is saying, he, uh, MacArthur explains as well, he says, Jesus didn't see this as something to be just clung to, clinging on to, and saying, no, no, you know, I have a certain right and I'm going to exercise it in the court of law and get what I want. There's somebody else you can think of when you compare Jesus, uh, the second person of the Trinity with, and that is Satan. Satan was not God, but he felt that he needed to clutch and grasp and reach for something that was not his. He wanted to be like God, and that was his pride that brought his whole downfall. Whereas Jesus here, who is equal with God, the Bible says, he did not treat that as something to be grasped. He didn't feel the need to cling on to his rights because he trusts in the Father and the will that he has. And verse 7 will explain what that is. But let's pause for a moment. Jesus was God, and he did not see the need to cling on to his rights. How does it apply for us today? You in the church today are in Christ and you are to have his attitude. So let me ask the same questions I asked of Jesus. Uh, who are you? You're not God, only Jesus is, but you are a child of God. Now as a child of God, you have a position that can never be taken away. This is 
This is who you are. Jesus is God. That can never be taken away from him. You are a child of God, and that can never be taken away from you. What are your rights? You are equal with all other believers here on this, in this body. There's no one believer who's greater or lower than the other. You're all equal in Christ. And what should your attitude be? should be pretty simple if you follow what Jesus did and what you are to do. You are not to cling on to your rights. It's so easy sometimes for us as believers to think like the world. The world puts itself first and says, what is, what is it for Mr. Number One, which is me? How do I make sure I get what I want and protect myself from everybody else who wants to take it from me? As the believer in Christ, we have a completely different attitude. We have the attitude of Christ, which is, I am not clinging on to my rights. My position as a child of God is secure. I don't have to fight for it because God has already made me his child, and I don't need to be clinging on and exercising my rights as if I am part of the world. So when you think of humility, that's the first attitude you want to be thinking of. Jesus did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped. You don't want to hold on to your equality as something that needs to be clung to, but rather you want to be humble as we see in verses four, 3 and 4. So with that, let's move to verse 7. Humility accepts humiliation for God in the incarnation. So what else did Jesus do? We see that he emptied himself by taking the form of a born servant and being born in the likeness of men. So as part of having Christ's attitude, let's look and see what Jesus did and how we must reflect his attitude. So what did Jesus give up? The Bible says he emptied himself. Um, this is one of those terms that can be used heretically. Uh, the word kenosis has been misunderstood to say that, hey, Jesus just kind of gave up all his divine attributes. He stopped being God in some way when he became a man. That would be completely, um, that would not do justice to everything that the Bible says, and it will not do justice to this verse. But before I look at this verse, let me ask you this question. When you see the Gospels, do you see Jesus exercising his divine attributes? Certainly. He forgives people's sin. He is still God. He can stop the storm and the, all of nature by a word. He is still God. He is able to heal. He is able to raise the dead. We saw this last week. He is still God. There is no attribute that Jesus had while he was here on earth that shows that, oh, Jesus stopped being God while he was here on earth. He retains all of the attributes of his deity when he came down here. So then the question is, what did he empty himself of? In fact, if the verse here in verse 7 said, Jesus emptied himself of divine attributes, we would bow to the word because that's what we do. We hear what God says. That's not what this verse says. It just says he emptied himself and then by taking the form of a bond servant. The right understanding of this text is that he emptied himself of the glory that he had with the Father. So here is God himself. In fact, in the Gospel of John, J Jesus would say just as he's coming to the cross and getting ready to go back to the Father, uh, that he would have the same glory that he had with him before the world began. He also empties himself of the exercise of those divine attributes. There are certain attributes that Jesus does not exercise while he is here on earth, but he is fully and completely God. Now, there is something else that is said. There is an emptying and there is a taking on. So what exactly did Jesus take on? Now, the word here used form is, again, an ontological statement. There is something substantive that Jesus takes on, the second person of the Trinity takes on to himself. So, uh, God the Son doesn't lose any of his divinity, but God the Son adds on and takes on humanity on top of himself. So, what used to be one nature, the divine nature, now the second person of the Trinity has two natures, both God and man. So, he is taking on something on top of his divine nature. But this is very interesting, the word that you see here in verse 7. He takes on the form of a, he could have said, the greatest man on earth, you know, the most powerful man on earth. That's not what you see. He says he takes the form of a bond servant. He chooses to become like a slave, a doulos, a, a person who has no rights 
of himself who owns nothing and is serving. Remember Jesus when he was here, he said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So the second person of the Trinity, who is in all glory, comes down here and takes on the form of a bond servant. He is here to serve and serve in the most lowliest of ways to all the people who have need. And that doesn't end there. And he says, and he was born in the likeness of men. Jesus takes on humanity. You know, sometimes you may think, we are so used to the incarnation, we forget this. But what you have here in the Christmas story, in the incarnation, is that weakness, frailty, ignominy is what is attached to the great God of heaven himself. Here is the creator who takes on the form of the creature. And if you want to think about what this attitude of Jesus Christ is, that should give us a sense of the grandeur that he leaves in order to become one of us and not just any one of us, but one who is in low form, in the form of a bond servant. So with that said, there's a lot more that can be said there, but let's now apply this. How do you who are in Christ have the same attitude that Jesus had? What ought you to give up or what ought you to empty of? You cannot empty your position. You are always and forever a child of God, but you can give up your privileges when needed in order to serve others. What ought you to take on this heart of servitude that Christ himself has? In fact, if you remember, Paul often calls himself a doulos. You'd think of the apostle who is so powerfully used by God would continually say, here I am an apostle, here I am an apostle, listen to me. But Paul always almost always. There are some times when he exercises his authority as an apostle, but almost always calls himself as a doulos because he has learned from Jesus Christ what kind of an attitude should characterize the life of a believer, and he lived that out, and that ought to be the attitude of believers here as well. So if you think about it, God, uh, the second person of the Trinity in glory comes down like a naked baby here on the, among humans in a dirty little manger. And so we read in the end of verse 7, he was born in the likeness of men, in the appearance of men, what he looks like. Can we stop worrying about our appearances? You know, it's so easy sometimes to just think, you know, this is who I am and people need to see me as all that I am. It's okay. God sees us for who we are and we can, with, without fear, without shame, serve in whatever capacity God calls us to. It's okay to get dirty. It's okay to sweat. It's okay to be out there and do the work of God when nobody else recognizes who you are. You want to think, when Jesus was here on earth, how many people thought, oh, this is the God of heaven who made me? Most people had no idea who Jesus was. This obscure person in an, in a, in an obscure village who's kind of saying all these things and he's the son of this little carpenter, you know, why should we even listen to him? And that was the attitude people had. Jesus didn't care what people thought. He knew he was pleasing his father, and that was sufficient for him. And that ought to be our attitude of humility as well. We look for to God and not to other people as we serve. Jesus came from heaven to earth to show the way. Now let's move to the next verse, verse 8. Humility accepts humiliation. The term humiliation is a technical term. In theology, we talk about the incarnation as part of the humiliation of, of, uh, of the second person. And it doesn't just stop with the incarnation, it goes into the crucifixion. In verse 8, we read, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. Now, here you read that Jesus was obedient. Whom did Jesus obey? Jesus obeyed God. So here was uh, the, you know, we talk about the covenant that God makes uh, in eternity past. The triune God um, determines that there is going to be a means of salvation that is to be accomplished and that the Son of God will be the one who comes and accomplishes it for him. He willingly obeys. He trusts in the will of God the Father and he, does, and he obeys at ex very great cost to himself. To what extent did Jesus obey? It says, to the point of death in giving up everything. 
Sometimes I, the cross is so familiar to me that I forget what that means. Uh, as I was thinking about my friend, you know, the possibility of death, he has a young family um, that he is supporting fully. If he were to die, there's nothing else my friend can do to support his family. There's nothing that you can do through your dead body. That is the full extent of everything that you can give in serving others. And Jesus is willing to go all the way to the point of death and giving up all for the purposes of God in obedience. And what kind of death did Jesus take on? The Bible says here, death on a cross. A humiliating execution on a cross, like a common criminal, naked, broken down and tortured, and out there for everybody to see. And while all the people there just saw the shame and the suffering, here was God obeying, uh, here was the Son of God obeying the Father in order to bring, bear our sins, and accomplish the purpose of God that no one else could see. Here was Jesus having this attitude of obedience to the Father in order to do the great purpose of God that would save all of humanity while all the people around him were laughing at him and mocking him. Let's now switch back to verse 5. You are to have this attitude which is yours in Christ Jesus. How can you now reflect that same attitude in your own walk? Whom do you obey? Whom do I obey? We ought to obey God. Why? Because God is trustworthy. If his word tells me this is what is pleasing to him, do this and not this, I know that, that this is the perfect will of God and that he will be pleased with it. And no matter what the cost is, I can never go wrong in that choice. There's a lot of people w walking through the, the crossroads of life, as it were, weighing the pros and cons of many things as you have to make those choices. But if you were to look to the Word of God and say, this is what my Father tells me, and it is good, I may not quite understand it, but if I were to follow it, it would please Him. If I were to follow it, it might be pain and suffering in the short term, but if I were to follow it, it is God's goodness that is working in and through me. I can obey. Why would you want to obey? Because you are in Christ. Christ is your savior. He is your exemplar. And you want to follow after him in your walk today. To what extent would you obey? The, Jesus here obeyed to the point of death. You ought to be willing to give up everything for God. When I, was sank, when I was justified, I recognized that my whole life was rubbish and everything I have is God's. But sometimes in my walk of sanctification, I tend to cling on to those things and I say, well, maybe not this. That ought not to be, brothers and sisters. Everything belongs to God and I ought to be willing to give everything up for Him. And this death, you know, physical death is, is a huge for, for many, fear, physical death can be fearsome. Um, and for many believers, it no longer is. And um, we know of believers who are there in uh, areas of persecution who do give up their life for the gospel. But each of us here have just as important a death that we need to be conscious of, and that is the death to the self, which is the denying of yourself, taking up your cross, and following after Jesus daily. And part of this humility is to have that kind of attitude that Jesus had. You came from heaven to earth to show the way, from the earth to the cross, my debt to pay, from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. You know, if the story of Jesus ended with the cross, that would still be pretty powerful in terms of all that Jesus did. But we all know that the story doesn't end quite there. God's good and grand purposes are revealed as we continue to read. So verses 9, 10, and 11 uh, unpack the rest of this purpose of God in and through the uh, second person of the Trinity. So in verse 9, uh, it says, For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Who exalted Jesus? Jesus. 
it was God. You remember when Jesus began his ministry, he had a temptation, the three temptations as it were, as Satan came. He said, you know, I can give you a little shortcut. I can give you the end result of the glory that you want. Just come and follow me, bow down to me. And uh, Jesus said, well, uh, he used the word to refute each of those temptations, but his attitude was, my exaltation comes from the Lord, even if it has to go through the cross. At the right time, God will lift up his children. You and I can count on that. And when the going gets tough, when it is hard to make those choices, remember there is a God in heaven, and he never fails his beloved children. As we continue reading, it says, At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So how exactly was Jesus exalted? God gives him, remember now we are talking about the second person of the Trinity that has both divine nature and human nature. Here was this man that was born in um, obscure circumstances, ended his life on the cross, and uh, now the whole world knows who Jesus Christ is. This man in a very remote part of the world God has exalted him, given him a name that is above every name, that at that name, all people shall bow and worship. Today, that may not be the case, but there is coming a day when people who are in heaven, on earth, under the earth, everybody will be lifted up, and they will recognize who Jesus Christ truly is. And every voice will acknowledge the lordship of Jesus. So, as we think about this um, I, I want to unpack this a little bit more, but let's just focus for a moment for ourselves. God vindicates you at the end. Brothers and sisters, we live in a world of grave injustice, both in the world and even within the body. There are strife and problems that happen all the time. When the Lord calls us to unity, you want to remember we are here to serve, and we are not here just as the judge to execute all that is right and good right now. God is watching over his church. Christ is the one who's building his church. It is on Christ the foundation. And one day he will present the, church, the bride of Christ, the church, as spotless before the Father. It's not on my accelerated time plan. You know, my responsibility is to be faithful to God and to serve the people, recognizing that God will one day vindicate all things. Now, when you ask the question, the end of verse 11 gives you the mindset that will help you retain this attitude of Christ. It says, to the glory of God the Father. The purpose was for the glory of God the Father. So why was Jesus exalted? In order to bring God the Father all the glory. How does this bring God the Father all the glory? Here you have a people that have rebelled and walked away from God. There is absolutely no way they can get themselves out of the mess they are in, and God brings Jesus as a baby, lives that perfect life, right, dies on the cross, and is buried, and then he raises him from the dead, and he ascends and sits at the right hand of God the Father, and he will come back to judge the living and the dead. And as you see the work of God in redemption, you get to see there is a wisdom that is so powerful that is at work in the life of Jesus Christ that gives glory and honor to God. You get to see the love of God that he loves the world so much that he gives his only begotten son that whoever may, believes in him may have eternal life. There is a love that is par excellence showcased on the cross that reveals the goodness of God to us. The mystery of God in all that was accomplished then one day will be revealed as Jesus humbly followed the will of God the Father. So how about us today? Do you believe that as you go through life with his trials and suffering, that God in his wisdom will accomplish his good purposes in you, that all things will indeed work together for good as you love God and you walk according to his purpose? Do you believe that the mystery of God is at work in you as an individual and in you as a body? As you seek to live out this unity that God has purchased for us through Jesus Christ, you want to remember it is the humility of 
the believer that God has called us to, keeping Jesus as our humble exemplar and remembering that the work that he has begun in us, he will one day finish. I want to have the attitude of living for Christ, to live in Christ, and to be like Christ. So we've seen, if you want to come back to that ski jump, we've seen the command in verses 1 through 4 that we ought to have the same mind and same um, attitude uh, toward one another to be humble and to regard our others as more important than ourselves. Verses 5 through 11 take you and give you that vision of Jesus Christ. So I, I would encourage you to constantly reflect upon the goodness of Jesus Christ that he sh as he shows us what it means to obey God, to love God, and to love our neighbors. And then verses 12 through 13 and beyond, as you go home and read, you want to reflect on what does that mean to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that it is God who works in you both to, uh, to desire those things and to accomplish them. You know, when I think of all that God has accomplished for us, it is not just that rescue from damnation, but it is to live in joy in the midst of adverse circumstances. You and I can do that because we have seen the work of Christ on our behalf, and he has shown us what a life of love looks like today. Uh, it is not easy. Like I said yesterday when I was um, preparing, I was deeply convicted about an area where I had been blind to. The Spirit of God, thankfully, doesn't leave us in our blindness, does He? And I would love to see how God continues to work in each of you today as He brings about glory to Himself as He works powerfully in each of you. Let us pray. Our loving Father, we thank You for Your goodness to us in Your Word. We thank you for your love that sent Jesus. We thank you for the humility of Jesus in accomplishing your perfect will. We thank you for your spirit that is so powerfully at work in us. Help us, O oh Lord. We need you to work in us in order that we can showcase your goodness both to the body and to the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.